Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is not a New Hampshire Peace Action, Peace and Justice conversation series because we are on an off weekend, but uh, or an off Monday, but we are uh, having program tonight. Um, if you are new to New Hampshire Peace Action, New Hampshire Peace Action educates, mobilizes, and organizes <laughs> to build a more peaceful and just future for all. We envisage a future where international relations are based on cooperation instead of competition and conflict, and where mutual benefit and shared security lead to a, to a more peaceful and just global community. Uh, in the spirit of understanding and respect, we would like to acknowledge that we are doing our work here in New Hampshire on the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land and waterways that they've been stewarding through the generations. Uh, tonight, we are uh, very, very excited to, uh, well, I mean, it, it's a, it's a uh, kind of somber uh, occasion, but we are excited to have Alicia Sanders Zachary with us. Uh, to talk, talk about both remembering Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also the work that's being done to make sure that it never happens again. Uh, Alicia uh, began her work as a peace activist uh, as an intern for New Hampshire Peace Action. Uh, I've been at New Hampshire Peace Action for 12 years, and it was well before my time. So she's been uh, doing this work for a while. Um, but she has, has worked... Um, in, in DC, she's somebody who I have gone to for policy briefings when I've been lobbying. Uh, she's currently working for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons in Geneva. Uh, and I'm not, uh, it, it is, it's really cool to have somebody who is the kind of expert that Alicia Sanders Zachary is, uh, who calls New Hampshire home. Um, and uh, she's, she is uh, at least nationally and sometimes globally known for understanding how to make nuclear weapons uh, uh, arms control happen. Uh, so Alicia, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can talk a little bit about your work at ICANN um, and, uh, and then we'll have some time for Q&A and we'll, we'll close with a little reading. Great. Um, well, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for, for having me. It's uh, really New Hampshire Peace Action was the start of my uh, peace activism from quite a young age. So I'm always happy to be back and, and, um, and, and speaking. Uh, I have some slides here, so I will just pull those up. <clears throat> just bear with me. I also have a bit of a cold, um, nothing to worry about, but uh, might be a bit hoarse and I might cough, but we'll power through. So can you all see my slides? Oh, just a minute. Great, great. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, I mean, happy. It's, it's of course a very somber occasion as well as said, but um, you know, a really important time to reflect on the impacts of nuclear weapons uh, and, and hopefully to have those reflections lead us to actions to work to a world free of nuclear weapons. So I'll talk a little bit about the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, share some testimonies from the survivors uh, and then speak a little bit about the problem of nuclear weapons today and some things that, that you can do. So starting just a little bit of background about the international campaign uh, to abolish nuclear weapons where I now work. Um, it's a, a global campaign of more than uh, 500, over 600 now partner organizations in over hundred countries. Uh, we're based in Geneva, Switzerland where normally I am based. Um, and our goal is to ban, stigmatize, and eliminate nuclear weapons. Our primary tool to do this is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, which I'll speak more about later if you're not familiar with that. Um, and th the campaign was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago when that treaty was adopted at the UN. Oh, and now we're working on this new phase of promoting uh, adherence to an implementation of the TPNW. But you know, going back to kind of why we're all here today, uh, I just wanted to you know share a little bit of information about the anniversaries, um, about the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, and then turn to really the most important um, thing that you can learn about nuclear weapons is really hearing from from survivors. So I have some testimonies as well. 
Um, but, you know, these bombings, of course, were the most, um, you know, incredibly catastrophic uh, bombings, leaving over 200,000 people in the two cities dead after two bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and, you know, one of the... <coughs> Oh, okay. Sorry um, about that, Alicia. That was I was trying to let someone in, but somebody let them in first, and I clicked mute on you instead of admit. Oh, no worries, no worries. Um, let me just go back to the slide here. Um, but you know, one of the things that was so terrible about these bombings, in addition to their immediate catastrophic impact, was the lasting uh, impact of radiation sickness that have plagued uh, many more people in Japan and around the world. Um, and notably, a lot of the survivors of these bombings who are called Hibakusha, they've really dedicated their lives to work for a nuclear weapon free world uh, and recently have been really advocating for this treaty uh, prohibiting nuclear weapons. So this is kind of a very iconic image that any of you may be familiar with of um, near the epicenter of the blast in Hiroshima. And to just you know, give you a sense of the scale of destruction, I always think these, these images are quite powerful. There's so many powerful images, it's you know, hard to know exactly which ones to choose, but this shows you, um, because today is the anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki, um, what the city looked like before the bombing and then what it looked like afterwards, the scale of destruction. So, you know, the, these survivors of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Hibakusha, um, <clears throat> it's really incredible that a lot of them have really relived their trauma to tell their story because of how important they think it is to educate um, other people and the next generation about the impacts of nuclear weapons. Um, and, you know, for all the time that, you know, many people have spent studying nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons activism, Really, these are the true experts of what nuclear weapons are. And there are so many ways to, to hear their stories, uh, to read their stories, to see pictures. And I put a few resources here. I'll try to share the slides afterwards. So if you want to read more, you can. Um, but I'll pull a few pictures. These are um, these really beautiful portrait uh, pictures that uh, a photographer named Haruka took and this is part of the 1945 project which I listed in the slide earlier um, and she paired these I think really beautiful um, portraits of Habakusha with um, parts of their stories and um, so I've kind of pulled some of those those pictures here with um, the a quote from their story these are all people who survived the bombing in Nagasaki how far they were from the distance of the bomb and of course their name so this is, oh, sorry. So I think, you know, a lot of these testimonies, they talk about exactly what happened at the bombing, which is really important to know kind of the, the horrors of that <clears throat> immediate experience. But again, I think it's really important to, to remember the lasting impacts of nuclear weapons, of radiation sickness, of poverty, of discrimination, um, that maybe are kind of the lesser impacts that we don't hear about quite as much. So here's an example of um, a survivor of the Nagasaki bombing. Um, in response to the question, so these are <clears throat> these are part of a website um, that I can put together. I can share that link in the chat, um, and there are links where you can read more about each individual on that website, but they're not in the PowerPoint slide. But I can put that link in the chat. 
Um, and so here, I think it's another example of not even just the one generational harm of these bombings, but the multi-generational impact um, of uh, people who were the descendants of the actual survivors of the bombings um, who are still impacted by illnesses. So the, and those are just a few stories. It's you know hard to really show the full impact of these bombings in one in one presentation. But I encourage you to to look at more later and um, and and hear those stories and read those testimonies. Um, so now I'll turn just to talking a little bit about the general nuclear weapons problem today. Um, there are currently more than thirteen thousand nuclear weapons in the world. There are nine countries that have those weapons. And many are on high alert, um, ready to be launched within minutes. What's really scary about this as well is that the risk of nuclear weapons use, uh, many experts think, is even higher than during the Cold War, because partly there are more countries that have nuclear weapons. Um, we've been looking as well at kind of how um, increasing application of artificial intelligence and cyber warfare can impact um, essentially nuclear weapons decision making and reaction times and it's you know pretty across the board there's a lot of concern about that increasing the risk of nuclear weapons use um you know what we learn from these anniversaries is that the humanitarian consequences of the use of just one nuclear weapon would be devastating um, and that many of the weapons in today's modern arsenals <clears throat> are are really many times you know, or orders of magnitude more destructive than the ones used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and, you know, furthermore, there's the, the economic argument that any, all of the billions of dollars being spent on nuclear weapons each year is really a, race, a waste of resources that could be better allocated um, to so many different things that would actually provide, you know, more human security. So I wanted to share a little bit of research that we've done recently um, looking at the nuclear weapon spending cycle um, and showing that in during in 2020 during a global pandemic um, nine nuclear armed countries spent 72.6 billion dollars on nuclear weapons um, and that money was in turn given to in billions of dollars of contracts to the companies that are building nuclear weapons uh, which then paid lobbyists to lobby defense makers to increase nuclear weapons budgets the next year. Um, and an inter interesting component of that is that also most major think tanks researching and writing about nuclear weapons um, receive uh, millions or sometimes even billions from these companies as well in one year. Um, so this is kind of an illustration of the waste of money and the vested interests that uh, kind of propel uh, nuclear weapons production. I can speak more about that if there others are interested. So another, you know, part of this problem, it's not just the countries that have nuclear weapons, it's all of the companies that are <clears throat> that are producing them and that are profiting from the continued production and maintenance of nuclear weapons. So I've put a list here of a lot of the US-based companies that are producing different parts of nuclear weapons to give you an idea of kind of who's a part of this problem. And in addition to those companies, um, there are a number of US financial institutions that are investing in those companies. Um, and this is not all of them, but is a, a sample and you can look up more if you're interested um, in the Don't Bank on the Bomb report um, that my colleague Susie Snyder at PAX puts together. And you can see kind of all of the financial institutions, banks, pension funds um, that are a part of the problem and that are you know, profiting from these weapons of mass destruction. Another component of it, I think, that is not um, always very well known is that a lot of US universities um, are in the nuclear weapons production cycle. They're doing research, 
Um, sometimes they have contracts uh, to work on different parts of weapons. They're managing some of the laboratories that are, um, that are building weapons. Um, or they have other types of, you know, uh, work short, workforce kind of partnership agreements um, with, with the laboratories producing nuclear weapons. Um, so we put together a report showing all the universities that have some links to nuclear weapons production in the United States. And there are a lot of them. So that's kind of a lot of the problem. Who's involved? What's the state of play currently? Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the solutions. So, you know, a big vehicle that I mentioned earlier towards um, a world free of nuclear weapons is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This is the first uh, treaty to ban almost, you know, every activity you can think of related to nuclear weapons, whether that's developing them, testing, producing, stockpiling, using, threatening to use. Um, and in addition to all of these prohibitions, it also has these obligations to actually start to remediate, start to remediate some of the harm caused by nuclear weapons um, from providing some assistance for the survivors of nuclear weapons using and testing um, and to start to um, remediate contaminated environments, um, environments that have been uh, contaminated by nuclear weapons use and testing. Um, there are currently 86 uh, states that have signed the treaty and more than 50 that have ratified it, that are fully bound by the treaty. Um, <clears throat> and this treaty it took full effect uh, earlier this year when there were enough countries that had joined it. Um, and the first meeting of states parties, all of the countries that have joined it will take place early in 2022. So this will be a big moment for all of those countries to get together and discuss how the treaty will be taken forward, how they'll start to provide assistance to victims of nuclear weapons use and testing, for example, and how to get more countries on board. Um, so currently, none of the countries that have nuclear weapons or that endorse nuclear weapons in their security policy have joined the treaty. Um, but really, there's a lot of hope that it will help to um, take forward the norm against nuclear weapons. Now nuclear weapons have been banned under international law. And even if the US hasn't joined the treaty, um, the companies in the United States that continue to produce nuclear weapons are committing an act that has been banned under international law. And that can carry some weight. <clears throat> so there are a lot of different initiatives um, that people in countries like the United States um, can take to support the treaty and to kind of support this norm against nuclear weapons and the will of the survivors of these nuclear explosions to work towards a nuclear weapon free world. Um, so a couple of these <coughs> excuse me, um, are the ICANN cities appeal uh, where you can work with your local city or town. There are a number of uh, cities and towns in New Hampshire that have joined on to this appeal. Um, to work to get your, you know, your city to say that we support the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and we want the United States to also join. Um, there's also the Parliamentary Pledge, uh, which is, you know, just for any elected representative to say, I personally want to work um, to get the United States to join the treaty. And we're seeing a lot of support uh, in the United States and across the world in countries Maybe they're you know, the top elite, they don't support nuclear disarmament, but there are lots of people in the country who do and cities that are signing up and elected representatives who are signing up uh, to support the treaty. And we know that we've got the power of the people on our side. When you do um, public opinion polls in, in any number of countries, so this is just a sample of ones that ICANN has worked on to show that um, by and large, there is a lot of support, uh, even in countries that haven't joined the treaty um, for nuclear disarmament, for committing um, to support a nuclear weapon free world. So I just um, wanted to show a little video um, that I think kind of ties together this moment, um, kind of what the treaty means for survivors um, and kind of the importance of, of taking action. 
this we did, uh, produced this video last year on the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, let me know if you can't hear the sound, Will. I'm not sure that might not come through. Can you hear it? Um, okay, yeah, this might be a problem. Um, I, I might just put the link in the chat and say if you're able to pull it up and watch it at another time, that might be better. This was the one thing that I did not. Oops. Okay, I can try, I'll try quickly to see if I can figure this out myself, but I might not be able to. Sorry guys. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure how to change the sound settings, unfortunately. Um, so I will just say, yeah, if you want to watch- Alicia, I can, I can walk you through it really quickly. Okay, so if yeah, you, sure. if Thanks. you stop sharing your screen. Okay. And now reshare, but as you go through, you'll see a box at the bottom um, uh, after you click the initial share button, you'll see a box at the bottom that says share computer audio. You check that box and that should do it. Oh, great, great. Thank you. All right, let's give this a shot. ずっと来てます。こんなの参政する国を増やさなきゃいけない。あの、菅総理はっきりもう背を向けてますよ、この条約に対してね。で、それに対して私はもう本当に最初はハードルが高いなって思うかもしれないですけど、まずは私たちのような活動のイベントに参加したりだとか、ウェブサイトとか、SNSを通して見てもらえたら、いつでもこの世界でもつながれることができるので、あなたは一人じゃない
to work for a nuclear weapon free world so that there are no more Hiroshima's and no more Nagasaki's. Um, so there is, there's so much that you can do. Um, I've mentioned kind of a few things already. Um, you can work to get your, uh, your city on board with the ICANN Cities Appeal to call for um, you know, supporting the treaty and a ban on nuclear weapons. Um, you can kind of look at all of the, the companies, the universities, the banks, um, the think tanks and call on them to cut all of their ties with nuclear weapons producers. Um, and of course, you know, importantly, is really getting involved with your local uh, peace organization um, and kind of getting tied into this, this global movement. So that's my presentation um, and look forward to, to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, and I'm going to start with, there was a question in the, um, in the chat. It looks like there was also an answer. So the answer... Someone also answered the question, but uh, the, the question was, does the, the treaty include protection yeah. against ger germ warfare? And it looks like we've got it. We've got one answer to that, which is that it was banned, that germ warfare was banned in 1975. But th this treaty is um, specific just to nuclear weapons, not other weapons of mass destruction. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, and it was actually really um, kind of inspired by the Biological Weapons Convention the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention, um, these previous treaties that had banned specific types of, weapon, of weapons of mass destruction and nuclear weapons before the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons were the only weapon of mass destruction that didn't have an international treaty banning them. So, you know, part of the inspiration of this treaty was to fill that legal gap uh, in recognition of how uniquely horrible these weapons are, um, that they should be banned under international law. So um, for folks who uh, joined somewhere along the way and, and missed my, my opening, uh, this is our, we've, we've, we've come to our time for question and answer. And if you uh, would like to enter a question in the chat, I'm happy to read that off so that everyone can hear uh, and Alicia can respond. Uh, you could also put an asterisk in the chat if you would like to ask your question yourself. Um, so, uh, so feel free to do that. Um, I want to ask, uh, Alicia, do you think that the, um, the nuclear powers are the primary, um, are, are the people who should be the, the powers that should be worked on the hardest right now by the global movement or should the, 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 the nation states that are getting the most attention, sh should those be, uh, those that are protected by other nuclear umbrellas that might be a little quicker to, move towards this and that's not to say we're not going to keep doing our work here in the u.s but um you know where do you what do you see the 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 low-hanging fruit for getting more states on the tpmw mm. well i think i mean we have kind of different strategies and kind of different different people really focus on like different countries within the the campaign i would say within our like international steering group um, and there's, of course, the strategy of just getting more countries that support the treaty to join because it's kind of it can be a very difficult just logistical process um, in terms of getting the instruments of ratification to the right office in the UN and every country has a different process to sign and ratify a treaty. So there are a lot of countries that support the treaty that want to join it. And it's just a matter of like getting from point A to point B. And so we have kind of a team of people that have all this expertise in different countries, intricate legal systems that are just, you know, working with different committed diplomats in different countries to, to make that happen. Um, so that's one process. Uh, and then there is also kind of the process of advancing the norm against nuclear weapon and uh, against nuclear weapons in the countries that, you know, their current political government doesn't support the treaty and doesn't support nuclear disarmament. Um, and I think that's, you know, the differentiation between the countries that have nuclear weapons and the countries that, that host nuclear weapons, like, you know, Germany, Turkey, the Netherlands, they all have US nuclear weapons on their soil, um, as well as the countries that are part of the NATO alliance, um, where they've kind of accepted that nuclear weapons are part of their security doctrine um, I think those are all 
I guess in all of those countries, you know, we're working with the cities, with the parliamentarians, uh, with campaigners to kind of put pressure in different places uh, and try to advance, you know, advance the the norm against nuclear weapons, the stigma against nuclear weapons to change, change current political leaders' minds. And in some countries, that's easier than others. Uh, like you have clear opposition parties. You know, in Australia, for example, the Labour Party adopts a document where they say they, if they come into power, they're going to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, or, you know, we're really following the elections in Germany, for example, where you have another, um, you know, another left party that really supports the treaty versus in the United States, you know, you don't have many people um, in the mainstream Democratic Party that are going to uh, that are going to, you know, say that it's part of their foreign policy platform to join the treaty. There are some, but it's definitely, yeah, a bit more difficult than in in some places like, you know, like maybe Germany. Um, but I think it's you can still use a lot of the same tools in these different places um, and just, uh, you know, work a lot with this is something that's really cool about being part of a, the global campaign is being able to work with campaigners in different countries who kind of have an idea of when there is an opportunity and momentum to kind of take that forward. Um, so I would say, yeah, I would say both are definitely important and it's just sometimes uh, it might be, you might make a bit more progress than others. Thank you so much, Alicia. So uh, there are a bunch of good questions in the chat. I'm gonna cherry pick a few that I really like. Um, this one's from Matthew. Uh, so Secretary Perry calls the, hype, the new hypersonic glide vehicles uniquely destabilized. Uh, Matthew's question is, can you explain the rise of hypersonic missiles and how they might change the paradigm of nuclear war? Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess I, I would, I'm, I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert on hypersonic missiles, um, but I would say that I think they're part of a number of new technologies um, that are changing the speed and the reaction time of warfare that are particularly dangerous dangerous with nuclear weapons. Um, because we know, because the stakes are so high with nuclear weapons and because when you make a mistake with nuclear weapons, it's over. Um, and we know there have been a number of close calls in the past. Um, and sometimes what is really needed is just a few minutes, you know, to be able to make a decision about whether if you know some computer system detects an incoming missile, uh, do you have a few minutes to think with a cool, mo cool head? Is this really a missile? Is this a computer error? Before deciding to launch a retaliatory strike that could, you know, kill millions, hundreds of thousands of, of innocent civilians. Um, so I, a lot of the, you know, concern about increasing automation of systems, um, about you know having even um, you know deep deep fakes or or things you know in social media or whatnot where you don't really uh, know if it's uh, computer computer automated or or real um, or kind of what the nature of the threat is. Uh, a lot of the concern around that is the increasing uncertainty um, and increasing speed can cause more mistakes and and allow for less reaction time um, on either end. So I think that's that's a lot of the concern around the increasing risk uh, of the use of nuclear weapons with some of the technology. Thank you so much, uh, Alicia. Um, I'm going to take this question from Arnie and Judy. Uh, the nuclear establishment tells us that nuclear weapons keep us safe from dot, 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 nuclear weapons. What do you say about the theory of nuclear deterrence? Well, it's it's a big myth, um, which you know I know Arnie and Judy know know as well. But um, we put together this we put together this little like pocket booklet um, called Five Myths uh, or How to Be a Realist: Five Myths About Nuclear Weapons at ICANN. The idea is you can just like pull it out when you hear one of these things, like nuclear weapons keep us safe and nuclear weapons prevented World War II. Uh, and I can put a link if that's useful useful to folks. But, um, you know, I think one of the one of the big there are many, many problems with this theory of nuclear deterrence, uh, which is, as as Arnie says, is this idea that, you know, having nuclear weapons actually keeps us safe because it prevents nuclear war, because if you have nuclear weapon and Russia has a nuclear weapon, you're not going to use them because it would, you know, end the world. 
Uh, and I think that rests really on, you know, too much uh, faith and trust in, in people and, and uh, a lack of understanding of, of human error. And, you know, we get called naive a lot for believing in nuclear disarmament, but we like to turn that on its head and say, well, actually, it's quite naive to think that you're going to have, you know, more than 13,000 nuclear weapons for all eternity and they're never going to be used. There's never going to be a mistake um, because we, we know there have been so many close, terrifying close calls in the past um, and to believe that we can keep keep on going on living like this forever and there's not going to be a mistake um it is is pretty foolish i would say um so you know that's that's just one reason why we have to get rid of nuclear weapons and you can't keep you know holding on to them and just trusting that you know it's all gonna it's all gonna be fine thank you uh chris hansen asks do you foresee any use of sanctions by some nations against others that continue to maintain nuclear arsenals? I mean, I think, you know, if that's a, a question about now there's like an international treaty, would there be like, you know, enforcement of this treaty, which could result in sanctions? Um, you know, the way that that international law works is in order for a country to be bound by a treaty, they do have to, to ratify it. They do have to say, I, I consent to be bound. Um, by this treaty. Uh, so, you know, for the countries that have not joined the treaty, they're not, they're not legally bound by it um, in a strictly legal sense. So there wouldn't be like, you know, any form of, of punishment per se, um, because they haven't joined it and they continue to maintain their arsenals. That said, um, you know, what we really looked at is that with previous treats, with previous weapons that have been banned, um, we've seen that some companies, even countries, have changed their behavior around that prohibited weapon because of the norm around that weapon. Now it's been banned under international law. It's not something that you want to be associated with. Um, and particularly for financial institutions, um, there's, you know, in a lot of financial institutions, they have this controversial weapons policy where they're pretty risk averse. And so they don't want to be investing in companies that are building these controversial weapons because public opinion may change and, and they don't want to have to, you know, be, you know, feel the adverse effects of that. Um, so now that nuclear weapons are banned, um, even though even though not all countries have joined that ban, there might be financial institutions that say, um, well, I no longer want to be associated with this weapon. Um, I'm not going to invest in companies that are producing nuclear weapons, and that's already happened. Um, so this is, you know, it's kind of this, I guess, this normative pressure, maybe this normative sanction, you could say, um, that I think we expect to see more and more of as the treaty uh, gains more adherence um, and becomes more, even more established in international law. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh... Catherine asks, does the U.S. care that it would be violating international law, not joining and continuing to make the weapons? How can we change that? Um, so, you know, have you found with any of the nuclear powers through your work at ICANN that, um, that there's a significant, that the nations seem to care that they're in violation of international law? Well, the thing is, they, they care actually quite a bit about this treaty. Um, and we know this because of how much energy they spend trying to pressure other countries not to join this. And this is sometimes, sometimes we just hear this, you know, from diplomats. Uh, they're not going to you know, go on the record or publicly say this, but, you know, they'll say, well, yeah, we've been, we've been told, we've been kind of faced a lot of pressure not to join the treaty. But we do have also some kind of concrete examples where, you know, like NATO uh, issued a, a communique against the treaty, calling on all of its uh, its countries and, and uh, partners to not join the treaty when it was being negotiated. Even more recently, um, under the Trump administration, the U.S. issued a letter that we were able to um, get a copy of that was urging uh, countries to actually withdraw from the treaty, uh, which is pretty unprecedented um, to actually call on another country to withdraw from an international agreement, um, in addition to calling on them not to join it. 
Um, something else that I think is really interesting that shows how scared uh, NATO and the nuclear armed states are of this treaty is, you know, they, they routinely will um, try to assert that the treaty will not become customary international law, which is kind of binding international law, even if you haven't joined on to the treaty, essentially. Um, it's kind of the one exception to when international law can actually be binding on a country without them having to join the treaty. And kind of in all of NATO's policy documents about the treaty, they'll say, we don't think this is customary international law and we object to this. And it's like, you know, we're not even saying that. So the fact that they're bringing this up and trying to say, oh, we don't, you know, this treaty, it doesn't matter and we don't want anyone to join it. Um, I think, yeah, the amount of energy that, that I would say they put into combating this treaty uh, shows that they do recognize how um, powerful it is and, and you know, how it can really change things. Thank you. That, that filled me with a, with a bit of hope there. I wasn't, uh, wasn't expecting that answer, but that's, a, that's really wonderful. Um, so that is about it for chats uh, in the, or questions in the chat right now. Um, I'm just scanning through. Oh, there was a, an early question that I think I I missed. Um, oh no, we that was, I opened with that. Another question from Matthew. He says, "With many major organizations being hacked more and more often, how do nuclear installations stay safe from that threat?" Well, I mean, I think it really is uh, a big concern. And, you know, one of these one of these scenarios that, you know, experts on uh, artificial intelligence and cyber operations, uh, nuclear weapons kind of put together is, you know, what what about if um, a system were to be hacked um, and uh, and the system were to stabilize and, you know, there was a, a problem with response or believing there was, again, kind of an incoming threat and, and a mistaken response. Um, and I think that we've seen that, you know, when at least in, in kind of one major um, Russian hack on the U.S. government, there were reports that the National uh, Nuclear Security Administration um, might have been impacted. And, you know, there's little that we know on the public about kind of the extent of that uh, breach, but it's certainly possible, um, and no system is immune. There are some, um, you know, you can see stories about kind of some older nuclear installations that try to use uh, older technology to try to kind of um, not uh, be a bit less at the risk of, of hacking. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's certainly a risk and just another, you know, explanation of why these weapons are are just too risky to, to hold on to when you can't afford a mistake um you know when we can't afford another hiroshima or another nagasaki um there's there's just nothing we can do then get rid of them if we want to be safe uh will thomas asks he says follow the money it is said how how much per year do U.S. taxpayers send to the weapons manufacturers? How do we best publicize the cost and what it takes away from life-affirming proje projects? Yeah, I mean, it's an enormous amount of money. So our, our research looked at the worldwide spending, uh, which is nearly $73 billion. But a lot of that was actually U.S. spending on nuclear weapons. Um, so the U.S. spent uh, $37 billion um, in 2020 on nuclear weapons. And that number keeps growing up. Actually, the US accounted for the biggest increase in nuclear weapons spending from 2019 to 2020 um, during a global pandemic. And the 20, uh, 2021 spending is even higher. And the 2022 budget under Biden, uh, unfortunately, continues a lot of Trump's legacy nuclear weapons programs, as well as the existing uh, program of record um, that was inherited from the Obama administration to continue to build more and more weapons, more sophisticated, more dangerous uh, nuclear weapons. So, you know, it's just an, an astounding, uh, astounding amount of money, especially when you think of, you know, what that money could be spent on instead. 
Um, and I think I think that is maybe, you know, it is it is hard actually to communicate how much money that is. Um, and, you know, maybe one way to do it is to connect it to um, things that people care about. So, you know, something we were translating the amount of money um, the U.S. spent in one year to how many ventilators, and ICU beds and salaries of doctors and nurses um, that you could be spending, um, you could be yeah, purchasing in, in one year instead of, of nuclear weapons. Um, and I think it's I think it is useful to actually break down that number because um, it's really hard to wrap your head around thirty seven billion dollars um, and how much that actually is. So you touched on this a little bit in your answer here, but Arnie and Judy say, what can you say about Joe Biden's view of nuclear weapons? Yeah, I think it's been really disappointing um, what we've seen so far with the Biden administration, because, you know, on the one hand, as a candidate, he would talk about uh, the importance of nuclear disarmament. He issued statements um, last year on the anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, he's, you know, before he, you know, he's committed to, to you no know, first use on the trail, uh, as I'm sure you all would be, you know, some of you in New Hampshire know more about than, than I would. Um, and yet he really has done nothing um, during his time in office to reduce the nuclear weapons threat. And, um, you know, particularly when you look at the, the 2022 budget, I think that's what's really concerning is that you see that he didn't take the opportunity to cancel some of the new nuclear weapons programs that Trump ordered. I mean, that should be the low bar is that, you know, at least you get rid of those. Um, and, you know, and really, I think, I think the U.S. has an opportunity as well with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, even if they're not going to be able to join it. They, I think they still should, given public support in the U.S., um, but has an opportunity to engage with all of the countries that do support this treaty um, to, you know, support assistance to victims of nuclear weapons use and testing, like the U.S. has actually supported uh, victims of landmine use, even though the U.S. hadn't joined the landmine treaty. Um, so I think there's still there. Th I think the Biden administration really could do a lot more. Um, and, you know, I guess the hope is that in the upcoming nuclear weapons posture review, um, they will shift more um, to cancel some existing you know, nuclear weapons programs and certainly drastically reduce spending. Um, and I, yeah, I guess, you know, one other thing is, is that there was a big meeting um, in Geneva between President Biden and President Putin. Um, and I think that that, um, you know, we certainly hope to see really further reductions um, in those two countries' arsenals. Uh, but I would say as of, as of yet, yeah, we haven't really seen anything to, to really prove to us that Biden will actually advance towards discernment. So we have to keep the pressure on. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, uh, Alicia. I, I do want to point out to folks that if you look in the chat, you'll see there are several links. Uh, there's a, a link to uh, a uh, Satsumo Yamaguchi uh, link, a few links on the hypersonic glide vehicles and the, the hypersonic missiles. Um, uh, links to some some different treaties and information about that, uh, and then Arnie and Arnie and Judy recommend the National Priorities Project, which has a tool so that you can look at your own community and what they invest in uh, Pentagon spending or specifically nuclear weapons, and then trade trade it off so that you can see what uh, what you will what you'd be able to do with that funding uh, were it spent on human needs. Um, and you'll get an email tomorrow from Doreen with the chat and all the links in it. Um, Alicia, do you have any final thoughts before I do a little reading and we say good night? No, I think just, you know, thanks. Thanks so much for coming. And um, yeah, I encourage you to, to read more of Baksha's stories and um, reflect on kind of their calls to action and think about how you can plug into the movement. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I, I actually, speaking of, of stories, and you you mentioned a few stories um, you know, tonight. I wanted to I wanted to close uh, 
by giving us some space to think about what it was that the United States did in 1945 and what, uh, what it is that we are constantly threatening the world to do. Uh, and when, when we talk about what our nuclear arsenal is, what, what kind of destruction we're actually holding on to. Um, you know, we've heard about 140,000 instantly killed in the bombing 76 years ago. We've heard 350 to a half a million Hibakusha who died uh, within weeks uh, of radiation poisoning, burns, and infections. Uh, on Friday, a few of us were at the Merrimack Re uh, River, where we we uh, we have a tradition every year. Although last year we didn't because of COVID, and and there was just a very small group of us this year where we lay flowers and we read the names and ages of a handful of the victims. Um, and I, I wanted to to read a portion of a testimony from uh, a Ms. Ms. Kinu Tomayasu. Uh, she was 44 years old at the time of the atomic attacks. She lived in Hiroshima. Uh, she was about five miles away when the detonation happened. And she, she lived 13 years uh, after Hiroshima and her, uh, her story was recorded on the atomic archive. And I just wanted to read a portion of what was recorded. That morning, I left home with my daughter. She was working at the Industrial Research Institute. Then an air raid warning was issued. I went back home, but my daughter insisted, I'm going to the office. Even though the air raid warning had been issued, she reached the train station. The trains were always late in the morning, but they were on time that day. So she got on the train. I went inside my home once I got home since the warning was still going on. I tucked myself in bed and waited for the warning to be lifted. After the warning was lifted, I got up and folded the bedding, put it back into the closet and opened the window. As I opened the window, there came the flash. It was so bright, 10 or 100 or 1,000 times brighter than a camera flashbulb. The flash was piercing in my eyes, and my mind went blank. The glass from the windows was shattered all over the floor. I was lying on the floor, too. When I came to, I was anxious to know what had happened to my daughter, Yachan. I looked outside the window and saw one of my neighbors. He was standing out there. I called Mr. Okamoto. What was that flash? He said, that was a killer beam. I became more anxious. I thought, I must go. I must go and find her. I swept up the pieces of glass and put my shoes on and took my air raid hood with me. I made my way to a train station near Hiroshima. I saw a young girl coming my way. Her skin was dangling all over and she was naked. She was muttering, mother, water, mother, water. I took a look at her. I thought she might be my daughter, but she wasn't. I didn't give her any water. I'm sorry that I didn't, but my mind was full worrying about my daughter. I ran all the way to Hiroshima Station. Hiroshima Station was full of people. Some of them were dead, and many of them were lying on the ground, calling for their mothers and asking for water. I went to Tokiwa Bridge. I had to cross the bridge to get to my da daughter's office, but there was a rope for a tote across the bridge. And the people told me, you can't go beyond here today. I protested, my daughter's office is over there. Please let me go through. They told me no. Some men were daring to make the way through, but I couldn't go beyond it. I thought she might be on her way home. I returned home, but my daughter was not back yet. I didn't see the mushroom cloud. I was trying to find my daughter. They told me I couldn't go beyond the bridge. I thought she might be back home. So I went as far as Nikitsu Shrine. Then the black rain started falling from the sky and I wondered what it was. And it was what's called the black rain. It was like a heavy rain and I had my air raid hood on so I didn't get it on my head fortunately but it fell on my hands and I ran and ran. I waited for her for the window, with the windows open. I stayed awake all night waiting and waiting for her but she didn't come back. 
About 6.30 in the morning on the 7th, Mr. Ishidu, whose daughter was working at the same office with my daughter, came around. He called out asking for the Tomoyasu's house. I went outside calling to him, I'm here, it's here. Mr. Ishido came up to me and said, quick, get some clothes and go for her. Your daughter is at the bank of the Ota River. I said, thank you. Thank you very much. Is she still alive? He said, she's alive. And added, I'll show you the way. I took Yukuta with me. My neighbor offered me a stretcher and I started running at full speed. People followed me and said, slow down, be careful not to hurt yourself. But still I hurried as fast as I could. When I reached the Tokiwa Bridge, there were soldiers lying on the ground. Around Hiroshima Station, I saw more people lying dead, more on the morning of the 7th than on the 6th. But when I reached the riverbank, I couldn't tell who was who. I kept wondering where my daughter was. But then she cried for me, mother. I recognized her voice. I found her in a horrible condition. Her face looked terrible, and she still appears in my dreams like that sometimes. When I met her, she said, there shouldn't be any war. The first thing she said to me was, mother, it took you so I couldn't do anything for her. My neighbors went back home. They had wounded family members as well. I was all by myself and I didn't know what to do. There were maggots in her wounds and a sticky yellowish pus, a white watery liquid coming out of all her wounds and a sticky yellow liquid. I didn't know what was going on. Her skin was just peeling off. The maggots were coming out all over. I couldn't wipe them off. I thought it would be too painful. I picked off some maggots, though. She asked me what I was doing, and I told her it was nothing. She nodded at my words. Nine hours later, she died on my lap. That's one, one, of, one of the over 100,000, uh, I mean, 300,000 who died in the in the months afterwards just one of the stories uh, imagining doing that to multiple cities and that we're preparing and that other nations are preparing to do it to our cities rather than looking for ways forward is appalling and um alicia thank you so much for your work and thank you so much for uh for being with us tonight um, and uh, let's go out and, uh, and, and see if we can change the course of history. Good night, everybody. Thank you.